may all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Cuke Audio Podcast. I'm D.C. Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives, doing our bit to help preserve the legacy of Shunyu Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his. And anything else that comes to mind, I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So today we have a, a reading or a comment and comments on Silas Hoadley. I'll read from his Cuke interview. And um, hmm, maybe I'll, I'll read a little from uh, uh, Tassara's stories. He's he's in there quite a bit, um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So uh, as soon as we've uh, had our pause to meditate, I'll uh, get into uh, all that material, huh? So uh, when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind. Hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to come back, hit unpause. And we'll hit the bell to end the meditation or whatever. And we'll give. (laughs) No, we won't. And we'll uh, check out Silas Hoadley. Silas uh, came to Zen Center in 1964 uh, through his friend Chick Reeder, who was a very interesting fellow. They both went to Yale, so I I assume that's uh, how they knew each other. Now, I I came to Zen Center in 1966, and um, uh, Silas immediately became a uh, sort of wise advisor to me (laughs) and I thought of him as an elder he was I was 21 and he was 27 (laughs) and um, he had an importing uh, business uh, uh, blown glass from uh, Okinawa and uh, uh, he'd hired Zen students to work in his place and um, but uh, he was Zen Center's treasurer. And uh, when we um, raised the money to buy the horse pasture, actually, uh, and then uh, took that money and bought Tassahara instead, uh, he was, um, you know, Richard Baker made the deals. Uh, but Silas, uh, as Bob Beck said, um, you know, worked out exact, you know, the details and and how the payments would be made and all that. And also, the Becks who sold us Tassara called Silas the, their, uh, the ace in the hole, uh, the Zen Center's ace in the hole, because they said uh, he gave them uh, such a sense of stability and confidence uh, that um, they felt that, you know, with the combination of Richard Baker and Silas Hoadley, and Shunyu Suzuki, uh, they they felt that Zen Center would come through with the uh, money, and uh, so uh, uh, we got Tassahara. Silas seemed to me uh, to be second only to Richard Baker uh, in terms of mm, Suzuki's. Uh, relating t- in, in in terms of closeness to Suzuki and and um, like who would who would 
become a te- one of our teachers. Um, when, um, you know, in the last year of Suzuki's life, uh, the, the way I remember it is I, I was living at Tassar, but I'd come into the city some, and Silas gave some lectures uh, there, and he was the only student I heard give lectures. Uh, so uh, that really meant something to me. Also, um, when uh, Jerry Fuller talked to Suzuki when uh, Suzuki was dying, Suzuki said, don't worry, you have Dick and Silas. <laughs> now, Richard Baker and Silas totally had very different approaches. Uh, Silas didn't, uh, wasn't comfortable with uh, Dick's imperial style and, uh, you know, uh, the, the expansiveness of it, you know, getting with it when we got the, the Gandhara and Gupta Buddha for the Zen Center Buddha Hall in Tassahara. Um, Silas thought that, that was just way too much money. I don't know, it was like either $25,000 for both of them or maybe it was $35,000 for both of them. I think it was 25000 for the Gandhara. But I I don't remember exactly. Uh, I, I hope to have those details later. <laughs> but also, um, I think Silas was against getting Green Gulch and he he didn't even want uh, Dick to be uh, become the abbot without the membership voting to approve of it, and uh, so there were just so many differences in in his vision of Zen Center and Richards. There really wasn't room for both of them there, uh, and um, so uh, you know that was very sad to a lot of people, uh, and uh, you know Silas. Uh, Went off. I'm, I tell this in, in Tassahara stories. Uh, there's quite a bit about Silas. Uh, now, now the first book that's going to come out that I'm just sending in the uh, final manuscript this month. Um, uh, you know, in a matter of days. Um, uh, it, it's only on the first year, but he's in there in the first year for sure. But. Um, in in uh, the subsequent books, which I hope will come out, uh, it it uh, follows Silas through through uh, you know the, 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 it goes through nineteen seventy five six you know sixty six through seventy five really, uh, and um, and there's a little bit of afterward on it of course, but. Um, let me uh, read to you uh, from uh, uh, Tatsara's stories just a little bit where Silas and I are talking. Yeah, I'm looking at the manuscript here. I see the first mention of Silas is him being the treasurer in, in um, you know, uh, of Zen Center. The second mention of Silas is when he introduces me to uh, Shunyu Suzuki. Uh, I had sat Sazen and bowed to him at the door, which we used to do on our way out of the Zendo at Sokoji. Uh, we, each person before, before leaving would bow at uh, the door to his office, and he'd stand there and bow with each person who came for Sazen at the end of morning Sazen and at the end of afternoon Sazen. Uh, but then, I guess it was in the hall, you know, we get our sandals and leave and, and just talk to Silas, and, and he uh, introduced me. So that was nice. So here uh, in this scene, uh, I have I have been uh, arrested for uh, stealing some thumbtacks while putting up posters uh, for the uh, Zenefit with Big Brother and the Holding Company and... Mm, uh, a couple other bands, Quick Silver Messenger Service and The Grateful Dead, um, I think. Um, you know, it's on Cuke.com. Anyway, it says so a little bit earlier than this point. Um, anyway, so uh, Tammy Robertson came and bailed me out. And so I went home then and to my apartment, which was just uh, a block from Zen Center. 
uh, and uh, Silas dropped by to see how I was doing. So uh, that's where we are here. So it says, that evening Silas dropped by my place. I opened a ceramic jar that was sitting on the kitchen counter, pulled out a 20 and a 5, and handed them to Silas with a, thanks for the bail money. And that was stupid of me. Next time, I won't get caught. Just kidding, I added. Silas smiled. Sil Silas was a respected older student, and he was an entrepreneur. An importer. He went to Asia to set up deals. He'd been to Okinawa earlier that year. He had an air of wisdom and kindness. I asked him how old he was. Twenty-seven. I thought he was older than that. He said he'd be twenty-eight on Christmas Day. Well, that increased his stature in my mind. I had him there, so I took advantage of his presence. Silas... I always thought reincarnation was part of Buddhism, but so far I haven't heard or read anything about his Zen wise. I asked Suzuki Roshi about it, and he was noncommittal. Richard, Richard, said he, Richard, doesn't even believe in life after death. Well... I think Richard means that Silas won't continue. Silas and David won't continue, he said. But what's fundamental continues. Maybe the essence is the same as our life here now. Hmm. Okay, something else. I, I was looking at all of the uh, old original going back to Buddhist days, the sutra books they have at Fields Bookstore. Now, how on earth did monks preserve all those ancient Buddhist teachings before they had writing? I read there wasn't any for the first few hundred years. Well, and Silas said he thought that reading and writing have shrunk our memory power. Zazen is what it all seemed to be about at the Zen Center, so I asked what I should do with wandering mind in Zazen. He said, when you're doing Zazen and have some idea, just put it in a box marked ideas and let it go. Hmm. I liked talking with him about Zen and Buddhism because he gave short answers that were easy to understand. N not that I thought I understood anything. There was a knock on the door. A visitor. I reached into the fridge, sold a guy a few tabs of acid for two dollars each. LSD wasn't illegal yet, but that made Silas's eyebrows rise. He didn't say anything, but I got the message that it's best if we leave that stuff behind. I think the story of our lives can be seen as the story of our habits the changes and the tenacity. Those dollars went into the jar. This is for future bail money, I said. Just kidding, he added. So um, here we have, in August of 1994, uh, I interviewed Silas uh, in Port Townsend. Uh, sitting around a fire burning in a big can on Niels Holmes's porch. <laughs> and I remember that. Um, <laughs> yeah, Niels Holmes had a great home. H-O-M-E, he had a great H-O-M-E. Niels, H-O-L-M, had a great H-O-M-E. was actually in, like, uh, design magazines and stuff. He sort of handmade home. Uh, it was just unbelievable. Got, you can see pictures of it on uh, cute.com if you want. Um, anyway, Nils and Silas were very, very close. Silas moved to Port Townsend originally uh, to uh, uh, be around Nils, or he first went there to visit Nils and liked it and stayed. And it is an awfully nice place. You know, it's um, in a on a, on a peninsula. Uh, but you get there by boat from Seattle, 
there's a lot of islands around there, and it seems like one of the islands. So, um, uh, you know, in this, uh, there's a very long interview. I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, I don't think. But, um, our, you, you know, in the interviews, uh, I, I like to take a quote from the interview and, and stick it up top. So here's the quote from the interview. Now, this is when uh, Silas so it's first at, at Zinsener in 1964. Thirty years before uh, I talked to Silas, and gee, it's been 30 years since. So Silas said, Suzuki Roshi said, I've come here to destroy your mind. That's what he announced. He said that in a lecture and explained it a little bit, and he meant the small mind, but it was a chilling statement. Having studied Gurdjieff, I had some idea of what he was talking about. I thought he really meant it and that he's a ruthless, destructive force as far as the ego is concerned. He really asked for it. This is an authentic person who very strictly represents forces of life and is in tune with those forces of life in an authentic way. That's what I felt. So that's way later in the interview. So I say, so what do you have to say about Suzuki in those days? And Silas says, uh, each of us had an experience of encountering this man. We had a personal experience, and then we encountered each other. It was a very large event in all of our lives. Many people came and didn't stay, and I could never understand why. I felt that he was an extraordinary person in terms of the deed and the word being fused. That was the main thing that impressed me, aside from the profundity of the teaching. To the extent that I was able to test him, I never found any chinks that I, could ra that I couldn't rationalize. So when did you show up at Sokoji? I came to Zen Center on April Fool's Day in 1964. Chick Reader had come to California to check Suzuki out and invited me to go with him. I was living in the spaceship, a, a drug house in the Haight, where we were, were experimenting with peyote mainly, and I was running an import-export business. I had worked for artist John Varda uh, the, the year before, uh, who shared an, a houseboat with Alan Watts, and I'd talked to Alan Watts, so I'd run into the verbal part of the tradition, but I didn't have any understanding that it was an actual practice it was living. I was always attracted when I read about it by the descriptions of Buddhism, especially Zen. Theravadan descriptions weren't so interesting to me. They always sounded pretty remote. Later, I came to appreciate them. Alan was very seminal in making it feel very attractive. So I went over there that night and began sitting and I didn't miss anything for about seven years. So how did uh, Suzuki strike you when you met him? My first impression of Suzuki Roshi, that he was in touch with a truth that was bigger than the truth I was basing my life on. I hadn't met anybody in Western culture that I could say that about. And there was the combination of his conduct and the teaching, and the seriousness of just his direct physicality and then his teaching of physicality of the body being necessary for practice and understanding, and the Western psychology that I'd looked into and other responses to suffering that I'd looked into all seemed to have a, you should do this and you should do that, but nothing like following your breath 
and the simple physicality made a lot of sense to me to explore, observing the body as it is, observing your life as it is, permission to examine things. It's legitimate to examine things in this way, and it's an old tradition, and I hadn't encountered this in reading or in anyone that I'd met. And we sat at that lecture that I first attended. There was a, a brief sitting we were sitting in chairs, but he described Zazen and what it was. He was lecturing from the Blue, Blue Cliff Records at the time. I early on talked to him about quandaries, about love and about suffering, living in a culture where love is made a great deal of and personally feeling bereft. What I was into was save the world and have a lady, a relationship. Compassion, but not a real compassion. I've been wrestling with that all my life. He talked to me about love, and I felt that he recognized me. I didn't really have confidence in my own grasp of what I was doing. He recognized that and gave me the feeling that it was legitimate to experience that. He'd been critical about the intellectual reasoning behind the great co-prosperity sphere, Japanese expansionism in the 30s. It's my understanding that he spoke out against it, but the response of the, of the authorities who tended to be repressive of any criticism of the government in the case of religious figures during the war just isolated them. They ignored them fundamentally, but didn't repress them like school teachers and labor leaders. It got harder and harder to be critical, but he wasn't arrested or even told to shut up. He just, he was just ignored. But I don't know where I heard that. And I said, well, I get the impression from what he said in lectures a few times and to me about this and from talking to people in Japan that he did what he could as a temple priest but got pretty quiet when the army really took over and the war was on. He didn't lead any pacifist movement or anything like that, like it said in the original introduction to Zen Mind Beginner's Mind by Richard Baker. But I've heard good things about how there were fairly open discussions in his temple going on quite a bit of the time. Silas says, he told me he wanted Dick Baker to be his successor. There was a sense that what was important was the fundamental teaching, that Zen Center was a tentative fiction and not the main point. The main point was the teaching, and Zen Center was an expression of that. He never made me feel or gave me instructions to say and support Dick or anything like that, but he knew that I probably couldn't have taken that anyway. I really didn't have an affinity with Dick so uh, that I could stay to help make Roshi, to help make the institution work along the lines that I perceived that Roshi wanted it developed. I think that he was mainly interested in, I think what he was mainly interested in was in showing the culture of the yogic side to things, the fact of Zazen. And he was quite specific about that, not like everything was cool. He felt it was hard to accomplish Buddhism in your life. By saying Dick is worthy of being called Roshi didn't mean he was thoroughly there. He always gave me the feeling that he didn't give his wholehearted approval to anybody. I remember people asking him, if Buddhism is so hot, why were the Japanese so terrible to the Chinese and why did they behave so badly? He said, you should have seen them 900 years ago when Zen was just starting. It was like this is a commitment of hundreds of generations and if you're really interested in humans, you need to have an actual deep perspective and it's not a matter of certification but that it's a real stream of compassion. And there were Buddhas before Buddha, and our problems are part of being human. The path that Buddha found out, found out was an approach that was very helpful, and that is what Suzuki Roshi was demonstrating. 
I was very encouraged with my encounter with something that said your authority, your closed mind authority is not the complete story, even though it felt like it. I'd come to some very early conclusions that started out with my going around the world. I thought I knew what was what and what the truth was about the world and whether it was open or closed. He sort of knocked my socks off, encounter him, and I believe his authority about how big the situation is. My encounter with him was around existential issues of existence and death, not who am I as much as what the hell is this and what are words, do they mean anything and can they be trusted, something that legitimized silence, being silent. That was impressive and that there was a tradition of respect for wordlessness. Part of it was the language he was using too, a new turn on language and a new way of putting things that had just enough of a spin on things that I found that began a process of loosening up on things that I held pretty strongly. I was very cynical about people and their motives and about the Western world and about the possibility of helping anyone. I was not at all interested in devoting my life to bringing consumerism into the world more fully, which seemed to be the cultural tradition I was born into. It seemed to me that Christianity was harmonizing with the situation as it is, and psychiatry uh, had bought into trying to get people back into the mainstream life and becoming a consumer. I understood that Buddhism doesn't conflict with that in Japan, and he said it doesn't too. He said, don't expect uh, too much results. <laughs> I've been practicing this my whole lifetime, and this is it. There ain't no more than this, and we've got to deal with this in our lifetime, and that's the way it is. And I don't have any magic bullet for you either. But there's some magic if you follow your breath and allow yourself to be yourself as it is. He said things in those terms, and that there was something else you can do with your life force that you haven't even considered as a way to go. What led up to getting Tassahara? We'd gone around and looked for land for a retreat in 64 and 65, maybe in 63. Even uh, Richard Heeb offered his space to Suzuki Roshi up in Jenner and Richard Baker and some others went up there, and I remember Richard saying Suzuki Roshi went out and found some bracken, some young ferns that hadn't even opened, and was delighted and cut them up and made a meal for them all, and Richard said he had the runs the next day like he'd never had before. He was delighted Suzuki Roshi had made this meal for him, though. Zen Center turned down the offer, probably Suzuki Roshi. It was incredibly lovely right at the mouth of the Russian River, but it was awfully remote. And Dan Welsh had been through about that time and had run into Richard Hebe, and he might be able to tell you about that. Great man, great man. He studied with the famous potter who made it big over here, Hamada. I think he had a spontaneous desire to have this beautiful place to go into some tradition and was impressed enough with Suzuki Roshi to offer it. When I first came in 64, there really wasn't a strong idea of getting a remote place. But I think by 66, Dick announced he'd found this place, and by the summer, we'd gone out and visited Tassara, and a bunch of us went down in October, and Dick had found out it was for sale. It was the horse pasture that we were interested in. The first commitment was to buy the horse pasture for $150,000, and then we would erect tents and build it up and backpack stuff in. I had been elected treasurer that year, so uh, bef that, that year before, so I was involved in being included in any flow of information. I thought it was possible because my business was taking off, and I felt 
pretty committed myself, and I felt that we could make money as a group, and I wasn't really, and I really was excited by the possibility of being together with a group like that. So I say, you told me back then that if we didn't raise the money that you'd sell your business and buy Tassara yourself. There, I I made a note to fix that on Cuke.com. Incidentally, I've got an endless number of notes like that. And right now I'm just hardly doing anything but uh, working on the book and then doing these podcasts that come up on the weekend. Anyway, Silas goes on. Suzuki Roshi went to New York and some money came in. And then I think Dick went down and was talking to the Becks about it. Mm, I think Beck brought it up that maybe you guys would like Tassahara and Ed had gone down to cook at Tassahara in the summer. Well, he doesn't have that quite right. I mean, there was, there was no going to New York until after the deal was made to Tassahara. Uh, yeah, Ed Brown had worked at Tassar the year before he bought it, and, and uh, uh, Richard told him uh, uh, about it. But it was actually Alan Winter who went down first that Richard told about, and Ed went down to join Alan, uh, who he came to Zen Center with uh, in 60, uh, in 65, uh, in the spring they first uh, started sitting there. Anyway... Uh, so I say, uh, Richard discovered Tassara first. Uh, others have been there, and uh, he'd heard about it. Uh, but when he walked in one day, uh, actually he and Jenny went there. They'd been camping up in China Camp, uh, and there were people shooting off guns in China Camp, so they got uh, they got out of there and went to the end of the road. Uh, and uh, walked through it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I say, uh, he didn't discover the horse pasture. It was just what came up as possible to buy uh, when they were talking to the backs about, you know, buying something. Uh, the backs weren't ready to sell Tassara yet. So uh, then I say, it, uh, it, was, it was just what came up as possible to buy at first, but it slipped over to being Tassara in... Uh, I say in November or December. No, at the very end of December. And Silas says, and I agreed with him, and we thought, wow, this is ground for Buddhism. This is an authentic treasure. This really deserves to be supported, and it's worthy of an institutional support. By this, I mean Suzuki Roshi as a teacher, his personhood, the trust that we had in him, I was perfectly comfortable risking my fortune and life and devoting it to this project. And I was always uncomfortable with the idea of the tents and carrying all that stuff in to the horse pasture. And so when the possibility of getting Tassar itself came up, I thought, oh, this is much better. Because then we could all go immediately and to get into gear uh, that we all wanted to be in, which was getting a place that was already going. It's beautiful. For $300,000 with rooms to move in, we got a Zendo, we can start practice right away. And logistically, the idea of camping out at the horse pasture wasn't attractive to me. I say the money was raised to make the down payment on the horse pasture, but it was put on Tassahara. And all of a sudden, it was 300000 instead of 150000 And Silas says, and then a letter went out and said that this opportunity has come up, and we were interested in down, in down the road, but we decided to do it right now. And then I said, and all of a sudden, we had a $48,000 payment due in a few months. No, it was $45,000. <laughs> uh, the board made, the, Silas says, the board made the decision to go ahead and buy Tassara, Dick came back and said, we had this opportunity. It was a group process. Dick did it, but he included everybody. There was discussion of whether we could do it or not. I was for it. 
and there was the certainty of income down there, which seemed like a wonderful opportunity for the practice of serving. He gave us a commune and a community right off the bat. It was very exciting, plus the hot springs and the beauty was incredible. The Becks were ready. They were tired of what it took for them to run it, and we impressed them with our ability to come up with the money to start with, and our relationship was developing, and Dick was a tough bargainer. Yeah, boy, that's true. Yeah, that was amazing. They originally wanted 450000 for it. Uh, I, I quote Anna in, in the book, in Tassara's Stories, of saying how it went from four fifty to three seventy five to three fifty to three hundred, and she said they really wanted to sell it to Tassara. She said I felt like we were handmaidens to Buddha. <laughs> yeah, listen, you know uh, uh, Silas and and a lot of the donors were very important. Silas put a lot of money into buying Tassara. He was one of the three big donors. Uh, Chester Carlson, inventor of Xerox, uh, uh, the the mm, Fidelity Family Fund, or whatever it's called, uh, Ed Johnson, uh, and Silas. Uh, but the Becks have to be included as a major donor, <laughs> really, because and and I knew the Becks very well. I mean, they they were hustlers, and you know, bought and sold antiques. But they they got very generous in, in selling Tassahara to us. Now, maybe they couldn't sell it to anybody else, but I don't believe that. There were other people who wanted it, and uh, it would just be a matter of time because they, before they could have sold it for more. So Silas said uh, he did offer, uh, Baker did offer uh, back, uh, acreage on Grasshopper Flats, which he never got. There was a lot of interpersonal stuff that went down between Bob and Dick, so we decided to do the whole thing, and it wasn't that much of a stretch. That's uh, true. Part of the original contract uh, was that they would have a lifetime estate there. And I, I would go with Bob Beck looking for what land to put it on. Uh, and uh, they never did, but, but it was just their decision, uh, they could come, you know, so they changed it. They could come be guests there for free any time and not have to build another home or anything. They, they, had, they had it made without that. So uh, Sada says, we got the Page Street building because Tassara was taking more and more of Suzuki's time and it was getting pressure from the Japanese community and they were saying, gee, we'd like to have our own temple priest, and these gaijin are too much for us. Maybe they should have their own place. And I think there was some feeling that we should do that. Suzuki Roshi thought it was a good idea, I think, but I can't remember if he suggested it. No, he was kicked out. I mean, they said, they gave him the, the, the board of Sokoji, the Japanese-American board, gave him an ultimatum, them or us. They could not take it anymore. They, they lost their temple to all these, all these, uh, 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 you know, besides calling them gaijin, which means foreigners, uh, they were American citizens. But it was for that Japanese-American community and just all these young people and everything and, and with many hippies and everything, they'd sort of lost their temple. It was very understandable. It was, it was good they did that. So Silas and Claude Dallenberg found the building. Maybe he's going to say that in a minute. Uh, he said, we looked at other places for some time. Uh, Dick had gone to Japan. I was president of Zen Center. Claude and I were looking, and the search took us several months. It was in the wind also because all the apartments in the Sokoji neighborhood had been taken over and there were a lot of people coming there, and the Japanese people were feeling overwhelmed. That's right. There was tension around it. There had been some feeling that we should be able to integrate, but that wasn't too realistic. I said, with Suzuki and Katagiri resigning at the same time, it must have been difficult for them. Silas says, I don't know what happened from the Japanese community perspective. 
And I said, well, I think Yoshimura, Ryokin Yoshimura helped out until Moriyama came. That's right. And Sada says, I was in a funny position when Suzuki Roshi was ill. I was president. He'd asked me to give the Saturday lectures in July or August, and I knew Dick would be coming back soon. My function was always to hold the fort, keep the finances reasonable, keep the commitment, and hold the fort with the strong understanding that Dick was coming back. So once Dick came back, I didn't have much communication with Suzuki Roshi because I wasn't in the transition team anymore. Yvonne was maintaining communication about Dick coming back and what was going to happen. My job was to keep up the forms. Katagiri Sensei was at Tasahara. I had no desire to communicate more. I wasn't anxious. The focus was that my wife was in trouble and I had a new child. I pretty much had my hands full. That's true. Uh, and I go into that quite extensively in Tassar stories. Uh, uh, Kathy Cook, Kathy Hoadley, uh, uh, she, you know, she had a, like a nervous breakdown or something and, and had to be hospitalized and their, their uh, baby, uh, you know, signed. You know, there were the silence was Shuso at Tassahara, and and um, he he was a hard ass. You know, he wouldn't help her or let any uh, any students help her, and she just couldn't take it. She and uh, it had been she'd had a wonderful time at Tassahara. She was in charge of sewing robes and a lot of stuff, and everything was wonderful. But then when she got pregnant, from that point on, it was it was downhill. She it took her time to recover, uh, and but she did. Uh, there's a tremendous amount on Cuke.com about her. Uh, so Silas says there was a communication going on between Suzuki Roshi and Dick in Japan through Yvonne, and my involvement was being in administration. I knew things were changing, and I felt pretty isolated. Suzuki Roshi had told me back in March or April or sometime that Dick was coming back and was going to be his successor. I'd known that for years. When Dick went to Japan, it was pretty obvious. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, do you remember, I say, do you remember Suzuki Roshi talking about starting some other place to work with people more closely, a smaller practice place? Silas says, no. I go, hmm, all right. Maybe Peter was talking about that back then. Anyway, go on. Silas said, I had been Shuso the year before with Tatsugami in the fall, and that's when Suzuki Roshi went to Japan to give Dick transmission. I remember the elbow and the shoving in the zendo and who had precedence. Well, that's with Tatsugami, the guest teacher, and Suzuki. Uh, Tatsugami was uh, really... Uh, sort of claiming to be the abbot where, where he was really the guest teacher. When Suzuki came to visit, they both walked uh, to, they both left their cabins with a jisha to go to the zendo to lead the next service. And they met, Suzuki went up the usual aisle for the teacher. Oh God, I forget which one. Hmm. I guess the right side, and Tatsugami went up the left, and they met right where you step up onto the altar, and Suzuki just, you know, moved over and went up. Tatsugami had to follow. Uh, there was never a word said about it. Tatsugami says, Tatsugami seemed to exert a territorial message. This is my place. I'm the abbot. And Suzuki had to fight with him to assert that, no, you're the visitor. This is my place. And there was a whole thing where they jostled each other at the door and who was going to get in and walk down first. Well, it was more like I think I had described it. But, you know, he was there too. Uh, and, it might have been when Mel was Shuso. No, yeah, well, that's true. That wasn't when Silas was Shuso. That was uh, Mel was Shuso, the 
uh, the spring before. That was when Mel was used to. So, yeah. So silence is sort of exaggerating. You know, uh, Japanese do things so much, so much more subtly than we do. There was no, nothing at the door. It was right before they step up. And Suzuki just did it. You know, I don't think he had to push him aside or anything. It, wasn't, it was his temple. It was, but silence is right in the essence. This is, I'm the abbot and you're the guest. But that was all done without a word spoken. And I don't think they talked about it afterwards. That's not their way. Uh, anyway, but that was the first year and Suzuki invited him back. Uh, he came back for two more practice periods. And he was planning on being the abbot there for life and everything at being his temple. But he wasn't invited back after the third time. Anyway, that's dealt with in uh, Quirky Cucumber and briefly in Tassara Stories. So, Nils, ah, Nils has been there the whole time. He hadn't said anything. He says, he was sitting up there on the altar. He did something. I think there was something on the altar that happened. Who was going, no, 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 Nils. It's all wrong. I'll just cut that out. I say it was fairly subtle for a struggle. Most people didn't even notice it. I think it might have been who offered the incense. It was ridiculous. Tatsugami making himself dojo. Yeah, he had a plaque made for himself that said dojo. And dojo is the abbot of the temple. He should, his should have been sedo, which means guest. And Nil says, of course, it was ridiculous. He was a strange guy, wasn't he? It was boring for him to have a temple, I bet. And he wanted to have Tatsuhara for himself, and Suzuki Roshi would have the city. He'd sit, and Tatsugami would sit and smoke all day. <laughs> well, that's a little uh, overstated, but he did smoke. He said he hadn't smoked it. He'd been, you know, at AG for 13 years. He said he didn't smoke there. But he had this little pipe, and he'd put a little tobacco in it. So Silas said, you asked me about Katagiri being Suzuki's successor, and probably in the spring he was clearing with a lot of the senior students about what their feelings were, but I thought that he'd chosen Dick, and that was the directions uh, things were going. And Katagiri probably wasn't the person to be the head of Zen Center at the time from my perspective. I thought Katagiri wasn't appropriate. And I say, I think Katagiri couldn't have been a successor because he wasn't Suzuki's student and had his own lineage. He would have just been giving up in a way. Uh, and Nil says, I was Katagiri's jisha and Suzuki's, and Katagiri was coming to Tassara, and he'd given his resignation to the Zen Center, and Suzuki Roshi called up and talked to Dan, and Dan came and told me to keep Katagiri in Tassara because he didn't want to see Suzuki Roshi, because Suzuki wanted him to stay, but he wanted to leave, and so I lied to Katagiri. Suzuki said that by any means he wanted to see Katagiri. Katagiri said, yeah. has he left the city yet? And I said, no. And I was there when Suzuki Roshi came in, and I've never seen them act that this way. But they did this Japanese trip on their knees and talked formally, and Katagiri was like a schoolboy, and they talked Japanese. So Katagiri stayed because Suzuki put the screws on him. And Silas says, he put him on Kobun too. Huh. Nil says, I was his jisha that last summer when he had cancer. I ah, didn't, we didn't know he had cancer then. Uh, that was, and Silas says, that was early in the summer when we had the ordination with the kids. No, that was the summer before. Uh, uh, and I say some of those things there. Oh, I say, Suzuki didn't know he had cancer that summer, and Nils goes, yes, he did. I said, no, he didn't learn till the fall. And Nils says, he knew and I knew. And I go, no. And uh, Silas says, yes, I knew. Well, no, I know what they're talking about. He'd had a cancerous, all right, here, I say it here. Uh, I say, well, maybe you knew he'd had a cancerous gallbladder removed in the spring, and he was pretty weak. 
and so you suspected, but I think he didn't know. And then when he got to the city, the doctor told him he had hepatitis, and that's what we all thought for a while. But maybe you're right. I think that the gallbladder had cancer. And yes, it did. And, Suzuki, and Japanese tend to see cancer as a death sentence. That's it. It's over. It's just a matter of time. So maybe he and Oksan had that sort of idea in mind, but they weren't saying anything to anyone except that he should rest, which he didn't want to do. Neil said, I'd be his watchdog and look out for Yvonne and Oksan who didn't want him to work, and I'd stand there and whistle to him when they came. He had me do that. I knew he had cancer because they were being so protective. And I say, it wasn't known till it was announced to the group in this city in the early fall. It was like, well, like October 11th. When he called his disciples to his room and said, I have good news. We all thought I had hepatitis and, and we were worried I was contagious, but it turns out I have cancer. And then he turned to Claude and said, Claude, when I'm gone, will you stay? And Claude was put on the spot and said yes. And Suzuki Roshi had the type, t tape machine stopped and rewound and replayed so he could make sure Claude saying yes was on it. Neil says, okay, but I knew he was pretty sick. Uh, I remember him coming down from the city and I was washing him in the baths and scrubbing him down. And I said, what is this mark you have? And he laughed and he said, this mark is from my gallbladder. Then they found out, so all that pain was for nothing, he said. And it was sort of like he cheated the doctor. He thought it was funny. I asked him what the marks were for. They'd burned him with incense. He said they burned him for the wrong thing. Oh, and I say, Moxie bashed in. It's like acupuncture with burning ends. People do it all the time in Japan. It's not that bad. Yeah, I've had moxie bust. Yeah, it sort of stings. And Silas says, I remember when we had that board meeting, and it must have been in September, and it was announced that Dick was going to be installed as the abbot. I said we should have a meeting of the membership and ask for their approval, and I got shouted down by Yvonne. No, no, we don't have time. We can't do this. I was trying to re retain a facade of democracy. And it seemed important enough to involve the membership. I felt at that point that the force field was being established, that this was going to be a monarchy <laughs> and nothing to do with anyone's choice. That's right. <laughs> Do you, uh, I say, it was imposed by Suzuki Roshi more than anyone, don't you think? <laughs> and Silas says, but there was an administration and the board had 50% of the power and that wasn't respected. That's right. The way the Zen Center was set up, it was like, I think it was a corporation soul, um, which is like the Catholic Church. Uh, and But that it was set up so that, but the corporation soul makes the abbot the most important. But, well, anyway, it was the board had one vote and the abbot had one vote. And that was never a problem with Suzuki. Uh, uh, and actually, it wasn't a problem with Dick because he was so persuasive. And the board would always go along. He, even if they started off everybody disagreeing, eventually he'd get them agree. Uh, and so Silas says that 50% of the power was with the board and that wasn't respected. Well, but I think his idea of, uh, of having the membership vote, that wasn't part of, I mean, that was his trip, his democracy trip. And the membership wasn't qualified to do that. I don't know. I, anyway, uh, it, it was, you know, he, he's he's uh, fighting windmills here. So uh, Silas says, the disrespect of the board of directors is a co-equal decision-making body with the habit was cut, even though that was our social contract. And then, and then from then on, that was trashed, and the directors were meant to be good page boys. I resigned the next spring and got out completely in the fall. There was nothing for me to do. 
Yeah, I know. That's true. That's true. Well, hey, I, I, when I was on the board, I'd pretend I had a rubber stamp and I'd go, right on, BR. <laughs> uh, but I liked I liked his expansiveness. I liked what he wanted. Uh, and, you know, he, he could be dissuaded. He was just strong, you know. Anyway, I say, I remember when Dan Welsh brought up at a board meeting a few years later that he was angry at Dick for pushing out all his peers. Well, no, specifically Silas he was talking about. And Dick blew him away and said that everyone who had a chance stayed. Yeah, that's right. But Dan was mainly talking about Silas. Um, and Silas says, I didn't want the job to be responsible for all those people in a therapeutic way. It wasn't something that grabbed me, and I didn't feel qualified to counsel people in that way. I say, Suzuki did talk to some people about who to make Abbott. He talked to Edward Conzi, who said Dick had the wrong chart for it and would squander the resources of the Zen Center. And Silas said, Conzi was great. I liked him so much. He was so biting. I said, he could be vicious. Silas said, but his viciousness was great and brilliant and entertaining, and it was directed at pompousness and arrogance, even though he had his own share of the stuff. Uh, and I say, I remember how Katagiri wanted out. We had a board meeting in the spring of 71 after Suzuki had recovered from his gallbladder operation, and I was invited. It was at Tassara. And it was so great. Suzuki was trying to get Katagiri to stay. Tasagami was uninvited for the fall practice period. And Katagiri said he'd do it if Suzuki shared the responsibility. I felt like I was watching a chess game and the final moves were so great. Suddenly Tasagami was gone and we had, and we would have both Suzuki and Katagiri there. Of course, it didn't work out for Suzuki, but Katagiri did it. But he still wanted out. Silas said, my understanding was that Suzuki Roshi had asked Dick to be his successor in 1965. Wow, really? Wow. Now, look, I, I was just in Germany, uh, and uh, uh, I talked to him about that. He said 1968. Uh, he and I sort of agreed 1968. I had thought 1967. I don't know, because I talked to Dick about it back then, and, and, and he told me that he'd been offered um, transmission, like not being the successor, but transmission, uh, you know, early on, and had turned it down because he thought it would cause too much resentment. But anyway, uh, uh and, and so Silas says uh, Roshi danced it to be his successor in 65 and that the whole, and, and, and the whole development of Tassar and Dick's confidence was based on that contract. You have to ask Dick, but I think that whatever he was doing in clearing people was just to make them feel included. His mind was made up and it wasn't an open question. He had no such contract with anyone else. Uh, it's, it's, Silas here is talking about Suzuki having no such contract with anyone else like he had with Dick. I'd agree with that. I agree. You know, my assessment of the situation at Tassahara back then, when we, you know, at Zen Center back then, when we first got Tassahara, uh, is that Dick was number one, and he was so number one that there wasn't really a number two. It was like he was one and two. It was like he was not in the same uh, category as anybody else. And that caused some resentment. Um, and I deal with that in Tassar's story. So I, I dealt with it a little in Crooked Cucumber. And uh, so Silas says, And Katagiri sensed the contract, and several people perceived that there was something going on. I don't think Dick would have taken on Tassar unless he felt there was a way for him to go with it. And it was really Dick who wanted to do it all along. And Suzuki respond, Suzuki's response to Dick's energy was to say, Okay, if you want to do this, I'll support you to do this. Oh, well, now Suzuki was extremely enthusiastic about getting Tassahara. It was, 
he was overjoyed. So uh, he wasn't just uh, doing it because uh, Dick wanted it, but, but everything sort of came together. Uh, and, and I'd say Dick told me that Suzuki Roshi wanted to give him the transmission ceremony when he first ordained him at the start of Tassar, and Dick said he refused. Dick's trip is that Suzuki Roshi wanted him to find a place for practice that was isolated because only Dick could practice in the city. Only he got it. <laughs> so really, that's the way you talk back then. So that's why he got Tassar, and he sacrificed his practice at that point to make it happen and work. But Bob Albert says that this is a good shit. He didn't feel it necessary to find a place in the country, that everything was going just fine. The big Dick and some others, mainly Dick, wanted to have a remote place, so that was okay with him. Uh, well, you know, Suzuki would say different things at different times, but... Uh, uh, yeah, you know, um, many Japanese, like older Japanese, they don't have a sense of t talking, uh, t telling the truth like the way we do. Uh, Suzuki did not always, he, he wasn't expressing, you know, this is how I feel, this is the truth. It, everything he said was for the moment. And sort of uh, dick that way too you know what impression do you want to make what uh, how do you want to express yourself now what's right for this moment uh, but anyway uh, and I'd say but anyway who knows and it's obvious that Tassar was a dream come true to Suzuki regardless of what he said to Bob right and Sada so says I think probably is Bob is probably reporting accurately Dick certainly would describe things in that way, but I don't think he had to rationalize it in the way he did. I think Dick was the only one who got it at that time. I think he had an attainment of the practice and an ability to enter the form of it that was ahead of everybody else. Boy, that's pretty humble of you, Silas. Some people say he was never there and he didn't practice. A lot of people were jealous of him. I'm saying this, but Suzuki sure approved of him, <laughs> right? That's so true. <laughs> he, and Sally so says, he was always there when I was there. Oh, is that true? He was always there when I was there. He was very present. Dick had done a lot of pre-training in his personal life. He'd studied a lot and taken risks, dropped out of school, studied yogic stuff and Eastern stuff, and he had major experiences with Charlotte Silver. There was some assumption in Richard's grasp of it, that he had accomplished the whole thing, and he asserted that with incredible vigor. And Suzuki Roshi gave him some kind of improve, approval. But my impression was that he was handling a very strong, forceful disciple and was handling him in an appropriate way. That's very interesting, huh? So I said, Graham Petchy was the Zen Center when I was there, and uh, oh no. Silas says, Grand Petchy was at Zen Center when I was there. Then he went to Japan. Actually, he'd been to Japan before you came, too. Uh, I didn't see him at AHG when I was there in 65, but I ran into Brian Victoria, and I had, who was Tatsugami's disciple. And uh, they put me in the emperor's room. They took me to dinner, and there were 300 old men and women who waited for me to sit down before they ate. I had just said that Suzuki Roshi asked me to come here and apparently that impressed everybody. Brian Victoria showed me around. Uh, Philip, w Philip Wilson had a hard time with Dick taking over. He later burned his robes. He was frustrated because Big Dick was getting the nod and he wasn't. And I said, well, he couldn't function. Suzuki had asked him to leave at least for a while, because it just wasn't working for him or for others for him to be around. And so he wasn't around much for the last couple of years. But he started visiting Suzuki toward the end. I think Suzuki loved him a lot. I think they had a feeling bond, but not so much a spoken one. But he couldn't function. And Sala says, that's right. Um, yeah, when, when, uh, when Philip... And Suzuki would work together. They were just like a team. It was like Philip would disappear. 
And so when Philip was with Suzuki, he was like enlightened. And Suzuki wanted to send him to the East Coast to be a teacher and stuff. But when Philip wasn't with Suzuki, he 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 would just go to his cabin. He had a battery operated, rec- you know, uh, record player uh, and earphones, and uh, you, you know his, his behavior got so bizarre. And I, I have been in touch with his uh, uh, widow, his wife, and you know, they they separated, but they were always close. J.J. Uh, Wilson. But J.J. said, you know, uh, Philip had CTE, the degenerative brain disease, from uh, having been a right guard of the Stanford football team. And, uh, uh, and, and he, was, he was the ultimate headbutter. He was built like a gorilla. Uh, and uh, he actually uh, got the role of the head of the 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 head of the guards in Planet of the Apes. Um, so uh, she said, yeah, he totally changed from when they were first together in the early 50s. Uh, and she said it was the football uh, that, you know. Anyway, uh, so uh, I said, I told Kobun that Suzuki Roshi said, He's going to give Dick transmission, and Coburn freaked out and went, no, 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 not Dick. <laughs> he said, but, but Philip, maybe. Oh, yeah. He said, he said, no, 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 not Dick. He didn't say that. Philip, maybe. <laughs> Poor Coburn. He was just distraught. Incidentally, Katagiri didn't like Dick either. Cotier did not want to be around with Dick out of his end center. Uh, and Sally says, I think Suzuki Roshi saw in Dick an incredible energy form, a totally Western energy form, and it was time for shock therapy. We can't just go by the formalities. This guy's got the juice. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I say, Do you think Suzuki made any mistakes? And Sally says, No. And I said, what, do you think he was infallible? Sada says, yes. And I say, do you think everything he did was perfect? And Sada said, at the time I met him, yes. He made mistakes with words. But in the main, I don't think he made judgment mistakes. In the main, I think he was out there on an intuitive level with people. It's one of those unfortunate things where I've got the true believer syndrome. But the criticisms I've heard of Suzuki Roshi seem to be just throwing words at him like he was naive or he was this or that. I don't see any real instances that I can't counter with the rationale that satisfies me. If I had real proof in my own situation, I'd counter. But I think he did okay by the culture, by Dick, by the people at Zen Center. He gave them a problem. We were all involved in a situation of transference. He said, I've come here to destroy your mind. Hey, this is the point. At the last, I said I'd never get here and toward the end of the interview. I'll read it again. He said, I've come here to destroy your mind. That's what he announced. He said that in a lecture and explained it in a little bit. And he meant the small mind, but it was a chilling statement. Having studied Gurdjieff, I had some idea of what he was talking about. I thought he really means it and that he's a ruthless, destructive force as the ego is concerned. He really asked for it. This is an authentic person who was who very strictly represents forces of life and is in tune with those forces of life in an authentic way. That's what I felt. That's a problem that I have. I don't know if anybody agrees with me. Ananda does, I think. What? Ananda does? Well, that's a whole other thing. Ananda was really mad at Suzuki uh, for letting Zen Center get so big. He felt that, like he de- betrayed the original idea of it being a small, intimate thing. And I had no sympathy for Ananda's, Claude Allenberg's, uh 
point of view there, but I recorded it all, and I spent a lot of time with him uh, right up until when he died. So Sally says, I think he had a teaching of selflessness, and he inhabited the teaching that he was giving. He was at one with the central teachings of Buddhism, and he seemed to have an extraordinary grasp of people. I never saw him fail in terms of people, but he couldn't stop everybody from killing themselves. He didn't claim to have the power to save Jeannie, and Jeannie Campbell, who killed herself uh, after he died, or Mrs. Bragdon, and there were lots of people. Ann Isaacson had contact with Suzuki Roshi, and then later she jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. He couldn't stop that. In that sense, he didn't have the magic zap, but he didn't claim that, and Buddha didn't claim that. But I didn't find the fallibility. If I had, I would have left. I was in it for the whole hog. I wasn't interested in a relative teaching. From my point of view, he satisfied that. I don't know what I was looking for, but I sensed through him that there was a bedrock that's available to all of us and that it's very meaningful. I understood Tatsugami had failings and I knew Katagiri had failings, but his failings were more along the lines that he didn't have the breadth to handle people at the time, and Suzuki seemed to be able to handle everybody who came his way in a big, inclusive way, and he would give them full attention and accurate response, but he didn't lay anything on people, not from what I could see. After Dick left Zen Center, it seemed fashionable to see Suzuki Roshi as having failings, but I didn't see that. Oh, maybe his memory failed once in a while. <laughs> Boy, that's an understatement. <laughs> My only hope is that memory isn't a criteria for it. <laughs> well, uh, that's said by a person who, who got uh, dementia at the end of his life. Uh, <laughs> Neil says, I... He couldn't remember the Heart Sutra one time when he was chanting at someone's home. He forgot things all the time. I saw his trickster side all the time. I had to help him cover up for Oaks on. Silas said, I never saw him do that as his attendant. I didn't see the trickster side of Suzuki Roshi like how he got Katagiri to stay at Tassara. He didn't let me see that side of him. And I say, like when Alan Watts came to see Suzuki Roshi and he let Nils do all the talking. <laughs> and Sally says, with me, it was an issue of faith. But to me, he was a very accurate human being, and I think the training works. But I don't know how Tatsugami got the way he was. Maybe he was born that way to a, a degree. And Dick, too. Suzuki Roshi harmonized his life with the situation. He did it well enough that it worked for me, and I suppose that's really all that counts. He didn't have self-interest. He didn't seem to be looking out for himself in any way, and I guess that's what I mean by infallibility. And he taught selflessness, and he was available to interact with people, and when he did so, I felt it was good for them. It was as good as you could get. He didn't try to do what he couldn't do. He understood that if we could spend 24 hours a day with Mrs. Bragdon, that maybe there was something we could do with her. That's what he said, that if she could have been around more, that maybe we could have helped her out more. But she was very far away. He said that to me spontaneously one day. But I was thinking, what could we do? Because my wife was suicidal on and off all the time. It was a threat in her makeup. And I say, D.C. note, Mrs. Bragdon was the mother of a student, Emma Bragdon, a woman who lived on the East Coast, and she went into the woods near her home one day and killed herself, cutting her throat with a, I say razor blade, no, it was a Swiss Army knife, while clutching a copy of Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, and I can add here, open to Nirvana, the waterfall. Suzuki went to Massachusetts, no, that's wrong, it was Vermont, and spent time with the family and did her funeral. So I'd say, what do you remember? 
Oh, now this is, maybe I'm calling him or talking to him on another day. Oh, this is 97 now. All that, all that before, all right, all that before was 94 August. And this is May 1997. I, I guess I call him or maybe I was there again. What do you remember about when Suzuki was dying? Silas says, I remember the meeting in the Doksan room, the living room, his meeting with all his disciples. It was a big deal. That was uh, immediately uh, after the mountain seat ceremony where Dick became abbot. And he says, Katagiri cry, cried and crawled to Suzuki. Boy, ain't that true. Uh, a few days before his cancer announcement, I talked with him, and he was fingering his mala with the skulls. That's the first time I got. That was the first sense I got he was going to die, a foreshadowing. I was giving lectures. I gave three or so in August and September. And I say, did he tell his disciples he had cancer from his bed, or did you meet in the tatami room? Uh so it says the cancer announcement was around his bed, yes. The last time I saw him, I was going to uh, lead a session. He just says I was going to session. He was going to lead a session in Quadra Island and a three-day session in Portland on the way. Oh, is that right? I went to say goodbye. He was sleeping, so I sat with him. And later, Yvonne said he was a little mad I didn't say goodbye. Well, that's right. I'm I say, anything else? He said, Suzuki Roshi asked me to ask Bill, uh, Bill Kwong, to teach Dan Welsh and me about the transmission ceremony, the names of the patriarchs. The night he died, he told Oksan he wanted to talk to Dick about me. He never got to. She told me when I came back, and gave me a scroll and one to Dan. It says something about a dot on the dragon's eye. She gave one to Ed later, I think, I said. Silas said, I figured I was moving out of the picture, so I didn't need to talk to him. And I say thank you most kindly. Okay. Wow, I read the whole thing. Uh, now... I'm going to go back to Silas's page and read just a few things that, that were put down after he died. There's a picture of him there. Silas Hoadley, December 25th, 1938 to December 13th, 2022. You are so warmly invited to celebrate the life of Silas with his father's day. That was this year in June. There's a little note about that, that Amber, his daughter, uh, and, and uh, her partner, Drew, Simon, and Priscilla, uh, uh, sent out. And, you know, I was here, so I couldn't go. So I, I write, December 13th, 2022, dear friend and Dharma uncle, Silas Hoadley died on Monday, December 12th. Silas has been suffering from dementia, but still we've had some phone chats this year thanks to Bill Porter. I just talked to Silas 10 days ago, and he was clearer than some months before. Bill said that that was because he was in a care home and had more people to relate to. And then after he died, Bill Porter sent an email. I'm so glad you and Steve Tipton could have time with Silas recently. Steve and I were both calling and talking to Silas. Isaac and I have been visiting him. Uh, Bill and his friend Isaac. Uh, uh, anyway. Isaac and I have been visiting him almost daily for the past week. He stopped eating and drinking a week ago, and he also stopped talking. He finally died tonight. Amber flew down and was with him shortly before he died. 
it was definitely time for him to go, and I'm glad he didn't linger any longer than he had to. May we all be so fortunate. Treasure the memories, Bill. So, hmm, I think that's it. I really enjoyed reading this and hearing what Silas had to say. Uh, and uh, sharing it with you uh, is very touching. Mm. So, until we meet again, this is D.C. Puba of Cuke Archives and Puba of Cuke Audio and Cuke Archives coming to you from Sleepy Sanur with Doggy Bandita, Feline Manis, Guest Doggy, Bumbita, and that. Well, could Trinka calls it a Bob White? It's a cuckoo or something out the window. I don't know if you can hear it. Boom, boom, boom. And we're all wishing you and yours a grand awakening. <laughs>